This is a short overview of CPIC, the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, and how it assists in incorporating pharmacogenetics into clinical practice. In 2011, we surveyed pharmacogenetics experts, members of the Pharmacogenomics Research Network and ASCPT, and asked them what their most challenging aspect to implement pharmacogenetics in the clinic was. And the number one reason cited was problems in translation of genetic information into clinical action followed by some other variables that are listed here. We actually repeated this survey a couple of years ago and found that these were still the primary impediments to implementing pharmacogenetic testing in the clinic. So again, these survey results, 95% of respondents said that the process required to translate genetic information into clinical prescribing actions was the biggest impediment, followed by genotype test interpretation, how to find phenotype from genotype, and then which gene drug pairs should be the first ones to implement. So partly in response to this survey, we formed CPIC back in 2011, and our goal was to assist users with this challenge to create freely available CPIC guidelines that were designed to help clinicians understand how available genetic test results could be used to optimize drug therapy. And we made a very explicit decision not to evaluate whether genetic tests should be ordered because a key assumption underlying CPIC guidelines is that clinical high throughput and preemptive genotyping will become more widespread over the next few years, and therefore the challenge for clinicians will be not so much whether to order a genetic test, but how to use genetic test information that's available even if they did not order uh, a specific genetic test with a drug in mind. Some key points about CPIC guidelines, we use standardized formats. We include a systematic review of the literature, we have a review a system for grading of evidence and of recommendations. They're peer-reviewed, freely available, updated. We have an authorship uh, with a conflict of interest policy that closely follows IOM or National Academy of Medicine practices on clinical guidelines. They are endorsed by some key professional societies, including ASHP, ASCPT, and are supported by CAP. They're cited as practice guidelines in PubMed and in NIH's Genetic Test Registry for Clinical Pharmacogenetic Tests. As of a couple months ago, we had more than 320 members, including clinicians and scientists from more than 230 institutions representing at least 29 countries. We have observer members from NIH and FDA, and we have a very active subgroup called CPIC Informatics that includes more than 30 members from 25 organizations. Also recently, we started another very active working group called uh, the Dissemination Group, and they're working to make sure that CPIC guidelines are more widely disseminated to practicing clinicians. Thus far, we have guidelines that cover 17 genes and more than 25 drugs, and they are listed here with the genes highlighted in italics and the drugs uh, listed below. These are all uh, posted on the cpicpgx.org um, website. The CPIC guidelines apply to many different medical disciplines, and we've broken down here the disciplines that are affected by CPIC guidelines. For example, anesthesia uh, is impacted by the guideline on um, uh, RYR1 and uh, CACNAS1 on um, their effect on volatile anesthetic agents and succinylcholine. There are cardiovascular drugs, infectious disease drugs such as voriconazole and abacavir. 
neurology drugs, including anti-seizure medicines, some oncology drugs, psychiatry drugs, including several classes of antidepressants, Isocaftor um, for cystic fibrosis, commonly used supportive care medicines like opioids and antiemetics, tacrolimus for transplant, and then allopurinol and resburicase. So how uh, do we decide which drug gene drug pairs to focus on? This is just an illustration from the CPIC website that indicates the different um, subpages on the site, including a page for all of the guidelines and the list of gene drug pairs that have been evaluated for their suitability for developing a CPIC guideline. Some basic information about CPIC on the front page and then some announcements and news. If we look at the uh, guideline subpage on the CPIC site, you can see that every guideline has a hyperlink. It indicates the drugs involved and the genes involved, and we always recommend to users that they should uh, go to the CPIC page first because this is where content may be updated as new information becomes available that might come out before the publication itself is updated. For example, this is the um, CPIC guideline page for voriconazole and CYP2C19. At the very top of the page is the most recent guideline publication, and there will be a, a place at the top of the page indicating updates since publication. In this case, there are no updates since the publication, but it's really important that users look here to see if there are any updated um, guidelines for each of these. We also list uh, the primary tables that are provided in the main manuscript of the guideline, and there's very um, key tables that are present in the supplement to the guideline that are actually listed primarily on the website. And again, it's really here that the user needs to go to get access to the content that's needed. This is a screenshot for the publication for CYP2C19 and Voriconazole guideline. It's published in Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, who have the first right of refusal for reviewing each of our CPIC guidelines. They do undergo full uh, peer review at, at that journal. And the journal has agreed to allow the content to be immediately posted on the CPIC website when the publications are accepted and for us to make updates to the guideline content as needed on that website. As I mentioned, every guideline has some standard formats, and these include uh, a table one, where we give readers an example of the likely phenotypes based on genotypes for the genes involved, with examples of diplotypes that could constitute those phenotypes. It should be emphasize that these are just examples if one wants to get the full list of the translation table that links diplotype to phenotype, it's necessary to go into those supplementary tables as indicated in the table legend here. The heart of the CPIC guideline is table two because this is where the prescribing recommendations are summarized. And in this case, we're talking about one gene, CYP2C19, and one drug, voriconazole. And patients can be divided into five main phenotypes. We use standardized terminology to divide patients into phenotypes, in this case, ultra-rapid, rapid, normal, intermediate, and poor metabolizer. And there are different therapeutic recommendations for um, each of those phenotypic groups and they will include specific recommendations such as choosing an alternative agent, in this case, for poor metabolizers and ultra-rapid metabolizers. We also classify the strength of the prescribing recommendations using a very simple system, uh, which I'll go over that grading scale in just a moment. The strength of recommendations in Table 2, we have four uh, descriptors that can be used, a strong recommendation for the statement that the evidence is of high quality and the desirable effects clearly outweigh the undesirable effects of making that prescribing recommendation, 
a moderate degree of strength of evidence for the recommendation, an optional recommendation, meaning that the prescriber would not be wrong to use genotype to um, guide prescribing, and then there is a possibility that there would be no recommendation for a specific phenotype um, drug pair within the guideline, and we use that as uh, infrequently as possible because we realize that's not very helpful to prescribers, but in some cases there's just insufficient evidence, confidence, or agreement to provide a recommendation. One of the things to emphasize is that the evidence that is weighed in deciding on the strength of these prescribing recommendations deals not only with the evidence that links the drug to the gene or to variations in that gene, um, but also to the evidence that is available for the alternative therapies that will be recommended in the case of a high-risk genotype or phenotype interacting with a high-risk drug. Sometimes we know that there is strong evidence that there's a problem in using a drug for a given phenotype, but if the evidence is not strong enough for the alternative, it may not be possible to provide a reasonable recommendation for clinicians. We do have a prioritization scheme that we try to apply when we're considering new gene drug pairs to add. Of course, if the gene is already subject to a CPIC guideline and we want to evaluate an additional drug that's uh, affected by that same gene, that that gets a very high priority. Then we will evaluate the evidence, including the evidence for the alternatives, and then we assign a grade to each gene drug pair. And these CPIC level grades are A, B, C, or D. Uh, CPIC levels A or B means that there is some kind of prescribing action that can be recommended and that the alternative therapies or dosing are highly likely to be effective and safe. In some cases, the evidence is weaker than that. So for CPIC level C, we make no prescribing uh, recommendations because the alternatives are unclear, uh, even though testing is common or, or the evidence is just too weak or conflicting. And then uh, CPIC level D, there's no prescribing action recommended um, because the alternatives are weak uh, or unclear, the evidence is weak. And this applies when testing is really rare. There's not a pre existing um, CPIC guideline. There's just evidence in the literature. And a lot of this evidence is well summarized in the Farm GKB annotations that apply to gene drug pairs. We are always willing to evaluate additional gene drug pairs that can be found from other professional society guidelines nominated by CPIC members or um, any of those that have a high annotation level in PharmGKB or those that are mentioned in professional society guidelines but, but not actionable. CPIC recognizes that there's a lot of value in providing prescribers information on what gene drug pairs are thought not to have sufficient evidence for prescribing actionability, and we have uh, on our list of things to do many such gene drug pairs for the future. The CPIC site also contains a list of organizations that are involved in implementing pharmacogenetics that use CPIC guidelines as part of their program to facilitate use of genetic tests, and we are happy to list uh, individual uh, healthcare systems who would like to be listed here. This provides a source of information for users who want to reach out to other implementers. Again, these CPIC tables are really critical for translating genetic tests into prescribing actionability, and there are tables to address interpreting genotypes into alleles, assigning function to alleles, gathering alleles into diplotypes, translating those diplotypes into phenotypes, interpreting those phenotypes, and then um, providing example prescribing actionability for the highest risk of those diplotypes. Again, a screenshot for the guideline for voriconazole and CYP2C19, and you can see that many of these tables are hyperlinked. They can be downloaded, and they include all of the functionality that I just described, and all of these uh, tables are reviewed by the guideline authors in the process of putting together 
every guideline. We also use standardized terms for genes and for the drugs that are affected by the guideline, and we provide uh, example wording for clinical decision support that can be used in either interpretations of the diplotype results or in pre- or post-test interruptive clinical decision support alerts. We do evaluate CPIC guidelines on an ongoing basis and update them regularly. Uh, in some cases, we completely re-review all the evidence and have a new publication um, that republishes all of the main dosing tables with a re-evaluation of new evidence. And we can make changes to the supplementary material and website as needed to add information. So to summarize, CPIC guidelines help clinicians understand how available genetic test results should be used to optimize drug therapy. Again, not whether tests should be ordered. Uh, so far, we have 22 guidelines in a standardized format, and they are freely available on the CPIC site as well as via PharmGKB. And um, CPIC resources are available to support the adoption of pharmacogenetics into the EHR with clinical decision support. And we're in the process of uh, uploading all of the data from our CPIC supporting tables into a database that will then be uh, queryable via an API and will facilitate regular downloads of all of the information in the CPIC supplementary tables by uh, individuals working in healthcare systems who, who need to have the data formatted electronically as seamlessly as possible. I would like to acknowledge all of the people who work really hard in CPIC, including um, Dr. Kelly Cottle, who's our CPIC director, um, Rose Gamal, um, colleagues in the PGRN, my co-principal investigator on the CPIC project is Dr. Terry Klein, and she's been involved from the very beginning. And we have multiple individuals at Stanford who've also been involved in CPIC heavily, including especially Michelle Carrillo, who, along with James Hoffman, serves as the co-director of uh, the CPIC uh, informatics working group. We also have a steering committee and a scientific advisory board who help to uh, guide CPIC, and they are acknowledged on our website as well. So thank you very much for your attention.